For almost 60 years, the trains of Otto Mears' Rio Grande Southern Railroad thundered across the gorgeous Colorado San Juan Mountains along a route spanning from Durango to Ridgeway, becoming vital to the economies of the area. My name is Zane Lewis, and for the past two years and over three prior episodes, we've covered the history of the line from its inception all the way through World War I and the Great Depression, and today, we cover the line through the 1930s until its demise in the 50s and what remains of it today, concluding Season 1 of Legends of Colorado and the story of one of the most incredible narrow gauge railroads anywhere in the world. The story of the Southern's journey in the 1930s began just a few years after the Great Depression began, when in 1930 the new receiver of the railroad, Forrest White, made various changes to the line's operations, rehabilitating the line's machine shops and ending its reliance on steam locomotive rentals from the Denver and Rio Grande. He even cut the DNRG's remote supervision of parts of the line, which the Argents had been paying a whopping $20,000 per year for, and replaced it with an on-the-site RGS crew, which only cost the line $5,000 a year. The New Mexico Lumber Company, one of the Southern's best partners, were still not operating their mill, therefore meaning that the trains leaving McPhee had to be loaded in the storage yards. The company began using Shea No. 7, a locomotive which had been constructed in 1929, to haul lumber between McPhee and the town of Dolores. The locomotive would end up being sold in 1933. In February of 1930, apt receiver Victor Miller began to use provisions of the Railway Labor Act to get more out of his employees' time without changing their pay rates, which would allow the line's motor cars, soon to become the galloping geese, to operate with just a sole motorman. In a move that almost doubled the amount of revenue the line was making from its mail contract, Miller eliminated nighttime mail runs in mixed trains, which increased passenger train profits, and in 1931, the railway post office route between Telluride and Ridgeway was reinstated after having been discontinued in 1927 and would run until 1933. In June of 31, Miller authorized the creation of Galloping Goose Number 1, which would become one of the most significant events in the RGS's history. Eventually, a total of seven of the motor cars would be created, and with the creation of the Galloping Goose, mail and passenger operations became significantly cheaper, helping the line to weather the Great Depression at a time when it was financially struggling. For the first time in the line's history, in the fall, over 14,000 cars filled with sheep and cattle were moved during the fall stock rush without leasing any other line's locomotives, with all six of the RGS's engines being put to use. In August, Galloping Goose number two was constructed, which would be followed up by the creation of Goose Number 3 in December and Goose Number 4 in May of 1932. A year after the development of the fourth Goose, in June of 1933, the fifth installment in the series was built, and with its creation, steam-powered passenger trains on the Southern were mostly discontinued, as it was much cheaper to carry passengers on the Goose than making all of the coal payments on the steam engine. However, at this time, there would only be four geese making the runs, as Goose Number 1 was scrapped sometime that year. Each one of the geese now handled their own circular route along the Southern, from Ridgeway to Telluride, Telluride to Durango, Durango to Dolores, and Dolores back to Ridgeway, with each one of the motor cars returning to Ridgeway every four days. In 1934, Miller purchased new land to construct new railroad buildings like an engine house, Y, and station, and built Galloping Goose Number 6, while in 1936, much of the depot at Rico burned, and the station agent's wife was killed in the fire. While repairs were made to the building, the business car Rico was moved to the town to serve as a temporary depot. On October October 27th of that year, Goose Number 7 was built to act as a spare for the other geese, and Goose Number 2 would be stationed in Ridgeway as a backup. This would be the last goose constructed by the railroad, as the line's decline would accelerate over the next decade. In fact, Miller liked the geese so much that he even told the Colorado and Southern Railroad that they should consider building some. Heading into the next year, Miller bought multiple freight cars, and over the next few months dealt with consistent snow problems, with numerous trains getting buried or derailed, such as Locomotive Number 20, which is now at the Colorado Railroad museum. Unfortunately, the 20s predicament became so dire that the superintendent of the RGS, Forrest White, left with steam engine number 455, the last RGS steam train available, along with every available worker on the line to go and dig out the wounded engine. Ironically enough, White's train would itself get stranded near Lizard Head, and his train would not be rescued until a few days later. During this whole time, most of the RGS was shut down. In August, Miller scheduled an inspection along the line, and in November, he divorced his wife, the daughter 
daughter of Judge Symes, the person overseeing the Rio Grande Southern's receivership. As a result of his dislike for his wife, Symes removed and replaced Miller with a new receiver named Cass Harrington. In the final part of the 1930s, the RGS oversaw the reconstruction of almost 80 of its freight cars, and the Southern also had to pay a $3,500 repair bill to the DNRG that Miller had left. After a complex agreement, the RGS agreed to take and pay for some of the cars that Miller had paid to fix, however gave the rest to the company fixing them, the General Machinery and Supply Company. As the Rio Grande Southern entered the 1940s, the railroad's feebled luck began to get slimmer and slimmer over the decade. In May of 1940, the depot at Hesperus burned to the floor and was never rebuilt, instead getting replaced by an ex-passenger coach. Additionally, the Montezuma Lumber Company Railroad's operations also began to falter during the decade, as the mill at McPhee and the Butterfly Mill burned down, and with daily traffic getting less and less along with natural disasters like flooding, the line's owner applied for abandonment. In 1941, with the Japanese surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, America entered the Second World War, and everything would change for the railroads of Colorado. The federal government believed that a Japanese invasion of mainland Alaska was imminent, and they wanted to take all of the trains that they could up to the territory to assist with the war effort. They requisitioned numerous of the Denver and Rio Grande Western's locomotives, and attempted to do the same with the Rio Grande Southern's, but thanks to the efforts of a state representative named Elizabeth Pallet, who was able to secure an RFC loan from the government, which was partially used for the RGS, the feds abandoned their attempts to seize the Southern's equipment. Additionally, many abandoned mines and mills were also savage for scrap as well. And thank goodness for Betty and her fight against the feds. Without her, most of the Southern's locomotives would have likely met the same fate as the DNRG locomotives which were scrapped, and the line probably would have died right then and there, just like the Silverton Northern. During the war, the RGS would help ship vital materials and ores across its lines to be used in the war effort. The government would also begin shipping old mine tailings along parts of the RGS to a site in Utah, and though few thought it was important at the time, those tailings would later be used by Robert Oppenheimer in the creation of the atomic bomb. It would be during the Second World War that galloping goose runs between Durango and Dolores were discontinued, being replaced by trucks. It was during this time in 1943 that multiple wrecks occurred, with locomotive number 40 being scrapped after its wreck, while number 455 was severely damaged in a runaway, and wouldn't be back in operation until 1947. Heading into 1945, the Rico Roundhouse was rarely used, and the roof had weakened to the point where it wasn't possible to put a locomotive inside. The situation for the RGS began to get so dire that the line's owner, a man named Cass Harrington, threatened to sell or abandon the line, which convinced the RFC to provide the line with another $60,000 loan, being used to fix up parts of the railroad. Had the Southern not received the loan, the line's story would have ended in 1945. After receiving it, Harrington would make multiple blunders, such as renting DNRGW steam engines while RGS once sat idle, and charging a $20 per car surcharge, which angered shippers, causing many of them to turn to trucks. In March of 1948, Harrington was killed in an automobile accident, and a judge appointed Pierpoint Fuller Jr. to be the apt receiver of the line, who would be the one to oversee the final days of the Southern. In February of 1949, Rotary Snowplow Number 1 exploded, and despite the Denver and Rio Grande Western offering to pay for the relatively low repair bill, it was never rebuilt. Without the Rotary, the line between Vance Junction and Dolores was closed due to heavy snow until May 15th, costing the Southern a lot of traffic and money, which once again went to the trucks. In June of that year, heavy flooding annihilated significant portions of the line between Durango and Rico, costing the railroad over $17,000 that it simply couldn't afford. It was at this time that locomotive number 20 was used in the film Ticket to Tomahawk, which was filmed on the DNRGW's branch between Durango and Silverton. In the fall, over 500,000 sheep were transported across the Southern in what would be the last big operation along the line. Heavy snow would once again force the RGS's Vance Junction to Dolores line to close, and for goods and mail to be transported by the trucking industry, which upset the local residents and post office officials, the latter of whom had a special contract with the Southern. This would ultimately result in a terrible beginning for the RGS's new decade in the 1950s, with the Postal Service losing patience and canceling their $30,000 a year contract. In May of 1950, a federal judge gave the Southern permission to discontinue its mail service, which at around the same time, in a last bit attempt to save the line, the RGS began running tourist excursions, converting the mail-heavy galloping geese into fun passenger trips. The railroad promoted these tourist runs extensively, with billboards along highways in the state. However, these tourist runs would come a decade early, and the railroad wouldn't be saved by the tourism surge that saved many other lines in the 60s, with the railroad only receiving a thousand passengers that summer, and the tourist geese runs would be shut down entirely in the fall. In August, with the railroad having not made any payments on its 
$60,000 loan in 1945, the RFC made a five-day inspection of the RGS, concluding that the line was in extremely bad physical and financial shape, with its revenues continuing to decline. Nevertheless, they did not recommend abandonment of the railroad just yet. In September, an RGS doubleheader stock train set off a forest fire along the 2.5% grade to Durango, illustrating a major problem with continuing to use coal-powered steam engines over diesels, which were gaining major traction at the time. At the beginning of 1951, the southern sole remaining plowflanger was wrecked along Lizard Head Pass, and with the railroad scrapping only a year away, it was never repaired or used again. In March, one of the southern's few remaining large shippers, the Rico Argentine Mining Company, informed the line that while it still supported the RGS's operations, it was beginning to investigate trucking options. Over the spring and summer, the RGS once again attempted to put the galloping geese back into tourist operations, which saw tourist traffic more than double from the previous year, but nevertheless, in July of that year, the railroad sold locomotive number 41 to a California theme park called Knott's Berry Farm, while Galloping Goose number 4 was put on a public display in Telluride in August. Both of these trains remain in their respective locations to this day. On September 1st, the Rocky Mountain Railroad Club made its last ever excursion along the line, and on the 30th, the last ever Goose Tourism Run was made, with many now coming to realize that this would be the Southern's last ever summer. With the decline in profits and more than $7.3 million in debt, the Southern's apt receiver Pierpoint Fuller Jr. petitioned a court to be able to cease operations along the Southern on November 13th and officially applied for abandonment. Over the next couple days, multiple runs along the line were made where locomotives number 20 and 461 collected some of their final loads and cars in Durango, Dolores, and Rico, and on the 19th, ore shipments on the line officially ceased for good, with an embargo being placed on freight traffic just a week later. On December 17th, the court officially granted the Rio Grande Southern permission to cease operations and apply for abandonment, noting the historic gifts of the line to the people of the San Juan Mountains in a heartfelt tribute, and the last ever business trains along the railroad would run that month. In the beginning of 1952, business car B20, known as the Edna, was sold to Knott's Berry Farm, along with Galloping Goose Number 3, and on the 14th of January, a formal application was filed to abandon the line, and permission Permission to abandon the line was granted on April 24th, with scrapping operations taking place over the next seven months, with the last train leaving Mancos on November 20th, 1952, and the last scrapping operation being completed in June of 1953, thus marking the end of a spectacular era of some of the most incredible and difficult narrow gauge railroading anywhere in the world. Well, what remains of the Rio Grande Southern and its legendary trains today? To start with, immediately after scrapping, many of the railroad's trains were sold to various different groups such as theme parks, cities, individual people, and the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad. In fact, much of the Southern's grade that was torn up was converted into standard gauge use along the DNRGW, including much of the line along the old Ridgeway route. Many of the RGS's buildings and structures survived the line's demise for at least a few years, with the Ophir Depot last lasting until 1961, and the Rico and Butterfly roundhouses until the 1970s, with other buildings continuing to survive to this day. In June of 1988, for the first time since the 1950s, Galloping Goose No. 5 returned to operation, getting the privilege of running on the Cumbris and Toltec Railroad, and on June 1st of 2000, 69 years to the date after it was first built, Galloping Goose No. 1, which had been dismantled in the 30s, was rebuilt by the Ridgeway Railroad Museum, getting fired up for the first time, and has since run during specials on the Cumbers and Toltec and Durango and Silverton Railroad. Today, hundreds of RGS rolling stock, steam engines, and the legendary galloping geese still exist, along with old railroad grade and numerous structures from the glory days. In fact, six out of seven of the galloping geese survived the railroad's demise, and along with the replica of Goose Number no. 1, they still run, with excursions at the Colorado and Ridgeway Railroad Museums, Knott's Berry Farm, the Durango and Silverton, and Cumbers and Toltec Scenic Railroads. There are three surviving RGS locomotives, those being numbers 20, 41, and 42, while multiple Denver and Rio Grande Western locomotives that were leased to the railroad are still around, including engines number 168, 223, 315, 340, 346, 463, 464, along with Colorado and Southern number 74. Some of the Southern's old railroad grades still exist and is hikeable, such as the Galloping Goose Trail, which starts near Mountain Village and terminates along Lizard Head Pass. This trail will allow you to view some incredible scenery and remains of the Southern's line, 
such as old RGS times. This trail will also lead you to one of the Southern's last remaining trestles, that being the incredible Trout Lake Trestle, where the banner for this documentary series was taken. Additionally, one of the three remaining RGS water tanks is located alongside the lake, with another tank being Enrico, while I believe the other one is near East Mancos on the Madden Peak Road. Head on over to Vance Junction and you will find Colorado's sole remaining coal chute, which was built by the Southern around 1890 and has since been restored. Over by Ilium, which is not far from Ames, is the remains of RGS Locomotive Number 19's tender, which is on Keystone Hill. This tender has literally been sitting here for over a hundred years since the train ran away in 1907 in absolutely crazy thought. Numerous of the Southern's depots have survived the century and been preserved, such as the ones at Telluride and Ridgeway, while the Placerville Depot still technically exists. However, it has been split into multiple sections, with one of the sections being added to the town's post office. There's still dozens of other remains of the line all across the countryside that it traversed that I don't have time to mention, such as foundations of old trestles, roadbed, and ore buildings left over from the glory days of mining, reminding visitors of a time long since forgotten. Today, there are numerous historical societies, be it the Galloping Goose Historical Society in Dolores, the Colorado Railroad Museum, or the Durango and Silverton Railroads Museum, that are all working to preserve different parts of the Rio Grande Southern and its legacy. The line's legacy also lives on in the model railroads that replicate the line, as well as by being built by fans in games such as Train Simulator and Minecraft. It's true that the RGS may have just been one of many narrow gauge railroads in America, and may not have gotten to achieve the level of fame or success that bigger railroads like the Denver and Rio Grande Western or Colorado and Southern did, but that doesn't really matter. What does matter are the people whose lives were affected and made possible by the Southern's locomotives, along with all the engineers and conductors who ensured safe operations along it. Together, these individuals successfully operated a railroad that ran through some of the most incredible scenery that God ever made, servicing the mountainous towns of the San Juans that depended upon the line for a connection to the outside world, and without the RGS, many of these mountain towns like Telluride and Dolores would have become ghost towns and wouldn't exist today. And I know that no matter what goes on in the world over the next few decades, there will always be those of us who remember the line and its accomplishments, while the towns and trains of the Southern will live on forever. Yeah, the Rio Grande Southern left one hell of a legacy over the 60 years that it operated for, didn't it? Despite an abnormal amount of setbacks and near total failures for the Southern, the line persisted, coming through for the communities who needed it, and most importantly delivering millions of invaluable memories and experiences to the people who rode it, and crafting the modern San Juans, along with all the model railroads of its fans. Though it may be gone today, its legacy is not, and thanks to viewers like you, nor will it ever be, and today you can still see the beautiful remains that the line left behind, raw, rugged, and incredible. Making this four-part series over the past two years has been one of the best projects I've worked on in my entire life, and to all the people who watched this video and the other three parts, thank you, and God bless. I'm Zane Lewis, thanks for watching.
Hey guys, thank you so much for watching this documentary. Finally, after almost two years, we've completed the entire four-part history of the Rio Grande Southern, and as I promised all that time ago, I will eventually be adding all four parts together into one full-length video. Unfortunately, I'm not sure when this will be out, as the other three parts, particularly part one, require a lot of re-editing and narrating, so hopefully it'll come out later this year, or early next year, but I can't really promise anything at this point. This episode is also the end of season one of Legends of Colorado. It's absolutely wild to think about how much better I've gotten at filmmaking since I posted the first episode about the ghost town of Eureka in July of 2020, and it's for that reason I decided to end season one here. With my editing skills having gotten pretty professional, in season two I want to make these documentaries in an entirely different editing style that will have a bunch of flashy edits and be more quicker paced, as this will fit modern YouTube better, rather than my current style, which would honestly be great for Netflix, but not so much on YouTube. Nevertheless, season two will still cover all the same kinds of places we've spent covering in season one, and still have the same awesome photo slides and videos that you love. As of right now, I'm planning on making episode one about the famous ghost town of Animus Forks, joining the ranks of my documentaries about Chattanooga, Eureka, Howardsville, the various ghost towns along Cinnamon Pass, and of course the Rio Grande Southern in preserving the history of the San Juan Mountains, which in my opinion is the most incredible place on earth. I hope to have this documentary posted sometime later this year, most likely in November or December. At some point in season two, I'd like to cover the Rainbow Route, which comprises the free short line railroads that supported the mines and ghost towns of Silverton, which is something I've been wanting to talk about for over three years. Thank you all so much for your support of this series. It's my favorite video series that I've ever had the privilege of making, and I look forward to seeing you all in season two.